Good evening. Welcome to Central News for Monday the 9th of December. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Thousands of tickets have already been sold for the New Year's festival, Mount Vibes, and organisers are expecting over 10,000 to flock to the Mount for the event. Organisers have tried to create a safe environment by offering overnight camping, which over 40% have sold, and buses to areas around Tauranga. New Zealand bands performing at the event will include The Black Seeds, I Am Giant, Blacklist, Sons of Zion, Tomorrow People and Aradna. Co-promoter Pato Alvarez says he hopes the festival will be so successful that he can run the event again next New Year's Eve and already has plans for international acts to headline. There, there, there's always been the idea, like we're working on a five years project. So by the end of these five years, I want to have 25,000 people here, you see. And, and like we, can, we got all the tools. We got amazing venue, which is, you know, ASB. Um, we got an amazing city, <laughs> you know, close from, from the biggest cities. Uh, we got the beach. You know, this is a summer destination, which is, is we, got, we got, as I said again, we got all the tools to make this grow. Next year, we just need to be focused more on in, in getting internationals. So if we can get the right international, they can put another 10,000 people just because it's, it's, it's a bigger name. So yeah, yeah, pretty much we, we definitely, it's not going to be the last year of Mount Vibes. A contested developer contribution fund has been allocated to provide a green space for the Phoenix car park on Monganui Road. The council voted to go ahead last week after many uh, argued the transformation will create a lack of car parks in an already busy area in summer. Mount developer Bain McDonald says the fund is set up to provide green space to offset intensification in the area. As it turns out, the development option didn't meet the, um, the resolution to reduce debt anyway. So it wasn't a great deal for the people, for the ratepayers. Uh, the option of retaining it as a park and using the fund achieves uh, the debt reduction as well as keeps it in, in the ratepayers' ownership. Now for our region's weather for Tuesday. Hamilton, a sunny spells with a westerly breeze. Your expected high is 21 and an overnight low of 9. Tauranga mostly sunny all day with a westerly breeze and an expected high of 23 and an overnight low of 12. Just ahead, teen drinking and what you can do as a parent. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. Well, it is the season to be jolly, but unfortunately that does mean that some of us can indulge a little too much. And with all the attention around teen drinking lately, I thought we should look at tips on how to approach the topic with your teenager. I spoke with Jackie Payne from Parenting Place to find out if Tauranga has a teen binge drinking culture. I think there definitely is a teenage drinking culture here. Um, it seems to be something that they are expected to do is just get drunk on the weekends. I'm not, but I'm not sure it's any hugely much different from where we were growing up. I think it's just a bit more visible. I think there's always been a pressure on teenagers to drink. Why is this? Is it society or is it their peers or what else? It's definitely a peer thing, I think, that's grown. Um, alcohol's become more accessible to them and it's just a lack of thinking through other things they could do in a lot of ways, such as the expected thing that every Thursday and Saturday night you end up going to town. And part of that going to town is the drinking. Where are they getting the alcohol from? Is it that, you know, the old story of waiting outside the alcohol shop or is it being supplied to them? I think a lot now is supplied from home. A lot of kids are getting their alcohol through their parents or their older siblings, which is an interesting new thing. I think, you know, when we were growing up, we did wait outside and wait for someone to come along or, you know, ask someone to buy it for us. And now they just do seem to be getting a lot of alcohol from their homes. Why do you think parents are giving their children alcohol? I think. What they reckon is that a drinking age, children will start drinking two years younger than what the official drinking age is in society. Um, and so while the drinking age was 21, they'd usually start drinking at 18 or 19. And now we've got a drinking age of 18. Um, teenagers are starting to drink at about 16 instead, which is a lot younger. And it is, you know, research proves that the longer you can delay drinking with teenagers, the better. 
for their brain development but also for the ability to um, handle alcohol later. So I think as parents we should really be hanging on to that and sticking together and trying to <laughs> help our children delay drinking as long as possible. I think there's also a culture of um, maybe trying to be too much of our children's friends when they're teenagers rather than um, being parents. And it's okay to be a parent. I think you earn the right to be a child's friend when they're about 25. <laughs> so while they're teenagers, we do need to be parents and put some good rules and boundaries and consequences around them. Where has that culture come from of parents wanting to be their children's friends? I actually don't know. I think it's just crept in. I think as um, we've become more, uh, both, both parents going back to work maybe, like there's a lot more busyness in society now, and so we maybe overcompensate with our busyness by trying to supply a whole lot of other stuff that maybe we wouldn't have done in the past. And I think there's a place for parents taking back on the role of parenting, and sometimes that can um, mean some pretty hard decisions around lifestyle. Where are teenagers mostly con consuming alcohol? Definitely in the homes, which is an interesting thing. Often with the going to town that teenagers love to do on Thursdays and Saturdays, they're not actually buying a lot in town. So they're getting um, a lot of drink at home, drinking themselves almost silly, and then going to town so they can have a good time <laughs> without spending a lot of money. And this is young kids in town? Evidently it's getting younger. I'm not sure on the statistics, but there are a lot of much younger children in town now, you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds, whereas legally, you know, they shouldn't be there until 18. And the question I guess then is, um, you know, where are the boundaries? Where are the parents saying, actually, you need to be home by a certain time? Is it possible for parents to have parties and provide a safe environment for their teen in the home? I think it's a bigger question than just the drinking culture. I think, um, Parenting is really huge and the, the values that you put into your children's lives, even from when they're very, very little, um, are really important when they become teenagers. So it's not as if you can just get a teenager and suddenly start putting boundaries and consequences and rules around them then. I think what you start doing as soon as your child's born is really important. Like if you have a culture in your home of good communication, of fun, of doing things together, of um, finding other things to do other, other than drinking, then they're going to grow up in that culture and be more able <laughs> to think of other things to do when they're teenagers. Um, if they, you've got good communication with your teenagers, that starts from when they're very little, when they're toddlers, not suddenly when they're a teenager. Yeah. So yes, go back to that original question <laughs> about providing a safe environment. I think the question maybe should be, um, is it okay? You know, are you okay with providing a party for an underage child that involves alcohol, or are you not? <laughs> what do parents do if they are worried about their teenagers drinking? I think a big part of parenting is making sure you've got a support network around you. Um, what we do with a lot of our courses is create a community. So when people come along to a course, it's more than just doing a course, it's actually meeting other parents who think the same way. Um, if you can create um, other people in your life that can support you, then you're more able to be a better parent and you know, get advice and just have someone else that can, you can lean on and you know, get advice from. If you would like to find out more, you can visit theparentingplace.com. Coming up next, the Rider of the Year. Welcome back. Tauranga RDA Equestrian Therapy Centre provides therapeutic horse-related activities for children and adults with physical, mental, cognitive, social or behavioural needs. The centre has recently introduced an award for Rider of the Year. Harriet spoke with Chief Executive Officer Kat McMillan to find out more. So tell us how this year has been for your centre. Well, we've had a fantastic year this year. It seems to every year grows and grows and this year we've had over 100 riders a week receiving therapy from us. So. Um, yeah, really big year, fantastic year. 
And you've recently introduced this award, Writer of the Year. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and why you think it's important? Yeah, well, um, a lot of our riders, they don't often receive sporting awards. You know, they're often unable to play um, regular games like rugby and soccer. So we do like to celebrate their, their riding achievements. And we've always had um, Rider of the Term awards. And this year we thought, Actually, you know, why not select one really special rider to get the Rider of the Year? So we started this up and we'll, we'll continue it every year now. Now, a nine-year-old student from Bethlehem College received the award this year. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about him and his journey with you? OK, so Richard um, came to us extremely nervous and shy, um, very intimidated by the environment and the horses and um, he just grew and grew and um, over the months that he's, he's been riding at RDA, so he's been riding for the whole of this year, he's just changed, he's completely come out of his shell, he's gained confidence, self-esteem, um, he's learned to ride a horse properly as you or I would, he's rising to the trot, he absolutely loves his horse, um, Harbour City Honey, and he just can't wait for his riding days. He's just, yeah, he's just an awesome guy. Wow, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Now you have riders um, aged from three to 65 mm. come and ride at your centre. Yeah. So can you tell us about what you usually see from their first experience to then months or years later? Yeah, so often um, people that ride with us haven't been around or on a horse before. Some of them spend um, a lot of their life in a clinical environment, maybe in a wheelchair. Um, and then they come to us, they're able to sit high on a horse and look down on everybody else rather than people looking down at them in the wheelchair. And um, it can be quite daunting at first, like it was for Richard, or some of them are just, you know, let me at them, and they're straight there onto the horse, and you're sort of saying, well, hang on a minute, we've got to, got to get you on properly. And, um, but the, the skills they gain and the confidence from doing the riding, as well as the f physiotherapy benefits, the physical benefits from the stretches and things they're doing, um, just phenomenal, you know, we just, it's mind blowing to see how much they develop. So why is horse riding um, seen as so therapeutic or beneficial to those who may be disabled in some way? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting um, form of therapy because often people think, oh, it's just fun pony rides and it must be a bit of time out for them and a good laugh, which obviously it is all of that as well. But um, it's actually um, much more technical than that in that we have a trained physiotherapist and an occupational therapist and they are receiving uh, physio and OT on horseback. So they're doing a lot of stretching. Um, the horse, the way the horse moves naturally stimulates muscle exercise of, of the person on the horse. Some of them might be lying over the rump or over the side of the horse having a good um, stretch and clearing of the lungs and things like that. But also, yes, the horse is a sentient, warm, um, friendly animal. Um, and so there's the emotional side as well, the trust of trusting a big, um, potentially dangerous animal like that and the companionship. So it's a lot of things all wrapped together. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm. Now, you also run self-esteem courses. So yeah. can you tell us about those? OK, so, yeah, we, we run programs, um, life skills, um, self-esteem for uh, youth at risk mainly, you know, people have from disadvantaged backgrounds um, may have some mental health conditions, so not a disability, but they may be suffering from anxiety, aggression, low self-esteem, maybe even suicidal. Um, and the, what they do is we have an eight-week program. They come in two hours a week and they learn to um, groom the horse, catch it, saddle it up, and by the end of the eight weeks they're riding as a team, um, doing formation riding, which is a bit like synchronised swimming on horseback, and learning to communicate with their peers, um, with the volunteers around them, and just the skills they gain and the confidence, it's, it's just great, great to see, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now tell us about your horses. Are they trained in any special way? They are, yeah, they're very special horses, and some of them, you know, they don't look like they're going to win the Grand National or the <laughs> Melbourne Cup, um, but they're a different kind of special horse, you know, and they're, they're priceless in, in their own way, in that they have to cope with a lot of um, environmental stimulation and not and not be phased by it. There's a lot of noise going on. We have a lot of educational games and props and activities that are potentially quite scary for a horse. 
Um, we have a hoist, so that's where some of our um, disabled riders get raised up um, by the hoist and lowered down onto the horse's back, which is a movement that a predator would do, you know, and there's a machine there. And they have to just stand very quietly and cope with all of that. But, but more than that, they actually have to be very active and walk up and um, physically um, sound and, and moving well so that the rider gets that full physio workout. So they can't be a donkey and sort of half um, switched off and, you know, so they're not just old nags, they're, they're actually really active horses that are really capable as well of coping. If people are interested in coming along and seeing what it is that you do, how can they find out more? Um, well, we, we're in Welcome Bay in Tauranga, so if you live in the area, drop in and see us. We, um, we have open gates for visitors any time, you know. We would love people in the community to come and see our riders in action and see for themselves. Um, but we have a website, that's equestriantherapycentre.co.nz. You can go on there, we have a Facebook page. Find out all about us. Um, hopefully you'll be interested in supporting us, uh, whether that's financially or, or um, by volunteering in some way for us. We always need help, we always need volunteers. And just getting behind us because we do great things. Um, we're a great team, a lot of volunteers, and just the riders are just very special people, and it's great to be part of that. For more information, visit equestriantherapycentre.co.nz. Stay tuned, as up next we see how the food bank is getting along feeding the hungry. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. A quarter of the children in New Zealand live in poverty and 10% in severe poverty. That was some of the findings from a report released today by the Children's Commission. And if those findings are anything to go by, that means there will be a lot of hungry children this Christmas in both our regions. We're always in need of donations. Um, at Christmas, obviously, there's a lot of extra expenses for people. Um, a lot of extra family come to stay. So we're always needing more. It's hard to know how much more, but it all gets well used. So there's never any waste. So please, yeah, feel free to bring us Christmas donations. How many people come in on average throughout the year? Uh, well, so far this year, we've fed over 17,000 people. So. Yeah, that's adults and children included. So that's a lot of a lot of people that we feed. And that's 17,000 people just for Tauranga? Yeah, that's just our area. And that's till the end of November, so... Mm. Yeah, that's a lot of help. And that's more than one meal too, because we, when we do a parcel, it's for more than one meal. So that's 17,000 people have received more than one meal from us, yeah. Jo, what does this increase to around Christmas time? Um, I think the increase is that people want to provide um, for their families and want to give their kids um, a bit of Christmas. I also think they go into debt um, to make that happen for their families and for their kids. Um, and also I think we get busy again in sort of January, February when school's going back, they start getting the first bills from what's happened in December, the repayments from wherever it's kicking and just uniforms and school fees and just getting back into that lunchbox thing. It's just huge on families and I think reality really kicks in sort of at the end of January and into February. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty tough for them. Uh, we have people who come in, you know, who are in tears because they actually have already told their kids at this stage that they don't, you know, there's just not going to be anything for Christmas this year. So, I mean, food's obviously a primary um, thing that we do here, but any cash donations are um, used for us buying staples. So every year we buy, not staples, but <laughs> we buy potatoes, um, some meat of some sorts, we buy, you know, just flour, rice, and just basic things like that which we have to buy in. So cash donations are used for those things. Um, and also, I mean, time is great if people have got some time or fresh vegetables, mm. you know, that sort of stuff. We love just having a table out there where people can just grab whatever they want. Um, and there's, um, you know, silver beet oranges, anything. And, and people come in with like three cauliflowers and say, oh, that's not very much. But, you know, for those three families who get that, that is like two meals of cauliflower. 
Um, and I guess the other thing is um, personal items and personal hygiene stuff, because that, that's quite a big and a big expense. And yeah, anything like shampoo, conditioner, deodorants, soaps, you know, just nice stuff that we all take for granted, but when things are really tight, you're just not able to do. And has this increased this year? I don't know that it's been um, a numerically an increase this year, but I think what happens is that there's a turnover of families. So what we're finding is that there are families who may have been in last year who no longer need us, and we just find that really exciting. Um, it's so good to see families who just don't need us anymore and they're actually managing to sort things out and life's going better for them. So I think the numbers you know, are pretty sort of stable most years within, obviously there's some fluctuation, but um, on the whole, I think it's just yeah, new families who find themselves in need for different reasons and, and yeah, so. Nikki, what kind of people come in? Is it just your stereotypical people on benefits or is it people across the spectrum that are now being affected? There's no stereotypical person or people that come in to see us that need our help. Um, it can be anybody at any time. Um, wage earners, it's not uncommon where they've had extra bills, um, family emergencies, things like that, and there's just not enough dollars to, to meet everything. So although we're a charity, no one needs to beg from us. You know, we're here to provide a service and um, we do it happily and to try and make it as pleasant as it can be. So for people needing us. Yeah. And are most people volunteers here? Most people are volunteers here. We couldn't operate without volunteers. Mm. Um, they give up a lot of their time. They do it every week often, um, occasionally twice a week, and they're on call. So when they come in and help, they're here for at least five hours of the day. Mm. So we couldn't do it without them. The only paid staff is Joe and myself. Um, and we job share to keep wages costs down. Um, and it's thanks to the Lottery Commission that we get paid at the moment because they've given us a grant. Um, so people's donations that they're giving aren't actually going towards our wages and that makes us feel good. Yeah. yeah to know that the dollars that we receive in donations goes directly to people that we want to help. So how can we help out the food bank, Jo? Um, that's a really big question and a really good question. I mean, obviously we need people's time. Um, and we have a really good basis of um, volunteers at the moment. There are practical things we need as well, like shelving. Um, we need um, a vacuum cleaner, if anybody would like to donate one of those. Um, and basically, if anyone's got anything which they think, oh, I wonder if the food bank could do with that, it is so worth just giving us a call. And 578 988. And just seeing if it's something that we can need, that we can use and, and need. If you would like to help out or make a donation, you can contact the Tauranga Food Bank 07 578 That is the programme for today. Email us or like us on Facebook and let us know if you have any of your own news you would like us to cover. Thanks for joining us. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around our regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.